Well, it's good to be here this morning. Uh, I'm actually glad to see so many faces out because a lot of us were out last night. So it, uh, to see actually people actually making it this morning is really good. Uh, I, had, I, I, I got back to Jessica and Chris's last night. And I was doing some reading and stuff, and I got to sleep about 1.30, and then 6 o'clock comes around, and suddenly I'm awake, and I'm like going, why does this happen to me? This morning, we're going to be uh, looking at a portion of Scripture from Acts chapter 9. And what I'm going to do, it's a long passage, but I'm going to read it out, because uh, oh, we got time. we got time. And you know, it's one of the things I think as, as Christians, and I, I've noticed this in other churches I've been in, that we often look at the Bible and we often want to just take little tiny bits of it and, and uh, uh, talk for hours and hours on end about little bits. But there's parts of the Bible that I think are really cool. And today we want to look at the life of the Apostle Paul. Because Paul, for me, is, is someone I really look up to because as a Christian, <clears throat> he, he in many ways is a hero to me because of what he stood for, for what he believed, what he taught, and how he lived his life. And I think for many of us today, our culture today, we're really lacking role models. People that we can look up to, people we can look up to as an example for our lives. Uh, in our culture today, it seems like people look to celebrities as role models. You know, they might be actors or singers or, or athletes. I remember years ago, uh, there was a professional basketball player named Charles Barkley who who really got upset at people because he said, I'm not a role model, I'm a basketball player. And that's true. But I think for many of us as well though, that our lives are a reflection to other people. So when people look at us, who are they really seeing? Are they seeing Jesus Christ? If we say we're a Christian, we're committed to Christ, we want to live our lives for Him, do we really see Him or do people really see him when they see our lives? And so this morning, I just want to look at the Apostle Paul's life because there are some principles and lessons we can see from his life that I think will help us, especially as a church moving forward, but also individually in our lives. So I'm going to read a long portion here in Acts chapter 9, and then we'll open in prayer. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you persecute, are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on the straight street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he had seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me to you that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and he was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem? 
among those who called on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord, and the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with him and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. They grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Father, for your word, which is not only instruction for our lives, but, Father, also a testimony of your love and grace. And, Father, I pray that as we look in your word today, that you would help us, Lord God, to see your message, the message of hope and salvation. And, Father, you would use this time to inspire us, to challenge us, to guide us, Lord God, in how we should live our lives, that we might honor and glorify you. We just thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Saul was a pretty, not a good guy. When he, uh, he, was, he, was, he was a man from a privileged past. He came from a, an important family from the tribe of Benjamin. He was taught by a man named Gamaliel, who was considered the, one of the top teachers of his day. He was a Pharisee. And here he was from this prominent position, brought to a place of being a servant for God. In that transition, he went from a persecutor to a servant. And so I want to look today at four principles and four lessons I believe that are important for us today. Things that will help us, I think, grow in our relationship with God, but also grow as a community of faith. And the first thing I want us to look at is that we need to face up to our past. When you look at Paul's life, he had a past. I mean, the fact is he showed up, you know, he was on his way to Damascus to persecute the church, the Christians, and everyone knew the reason why he was there. Um, I bet many of you have probably met people who, you, you meet certain people and they, you've already heard all the things about them, right? Their reputation kind of precedes them. And this was, this was a man who, who had that. Saul was a man who was feared. He was there when Stephen was stoned. And many people didn't know what to do with this man. Because I think many Christians that day, if they saw him, they'd probably run off and hide. Because they thought, if he finds me, he's going to take me away and arrest me. But the reality is our lives, our sins, they all have consequences. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. You know, our lives are a reflection of Christ. So as Christians, we are called to live our lives and reflect Him. But unfortunately, we also have pasts. We've also done things wrong in our past. And we also have reputations and history. And it's not just people and individuals, but churches as well. I've served in a couple different churches in the past. Uh, the last church I served at as a pastor actually had a very bad reputation. Had a bad reputation for beating up pastors, actually. But it was very difficult, you know, and, and so people become afraid because they, they hear all these things about, you know, whether it's a Christian or a church, and people become weary, like, why would I want to go there? But I think as Christians, we need to face up to our past. We need to look at relationships that we have, and we need to live out, you know, forgiveness and grace. Because when we do that, it leads to freedom, it leads to growth. I mean, I have no doubt here, you know, for many of you, you guys have grown up together. You guys have spent how many years, maybe decades together. And no doubt, there are probably times we might have hurt each other. But what Christianity does, what faith does, it allows us to forgive, to let go of those things in the past, and allows us to come together as a community of faith so that we can grow and become more effective ministers for Christ. 
Because when we do that, when we face our past, when we learn to walk in forgiveness and grace, it allows us then to have a better understanding of who we are. It allows us to have a better understanding of who God is. And allows us then to be used by God to the furtherance of His kingdom. So facing up to our past is one thing I think we all individually need to do, but also as a church. Because Paul had to do that. Saul had to do that. Can you imagine that everybody would have been you know, coming at him, just bashing him? Saying, what are you doing with him? Why are you allowing him here? He's dangerous. He's a spy. Paul had to deal with it. And I think for all of us, we all have to deal with our past. We have to turn it over to God, and we have to allow God to work in us and to work in each other to move forward. And that's just a simple thing for all of us to face up to our past. But the second thing, the second lesson I think we hear from the life of Paul is that we need to develop trust with each other. Now Paul had this reputation. He had a reputation of coming in, stirring the pot, messing up things, arresting people, probably killing other people. He was probably involved with the killing of other Christians in that day. So he had a reputation that nobody wanted to trust him. But what happened, you see in the story here, is that God worked in the life of Ananias. He worked in the life of Barnabas to reach out to Saul, to reach out and say, you know, we need to trust that God is at work in this man. And we need to trust that God will work and continue that work he's begun in him. You see, Ananias, he, he risked his life to go see Saul. Can you imagine if you, you know, if God said to you, I want you to go talk to, you know, I don't know, who would be the worst, like that guy who just died in the States, that, uh, uh, Ariel Castro. Ariel Castro, yeah, the one who kidnapped his woman. If God asked you to go talk to him, would you go do it? That would be kind of freaky, wouldn't it? That would be kind of freaky. But I think as Christians, you know, when God is speaking to us, to go reach out, to go, to get uncomfortable, that we need to trust God. But it also expands to us as a church as well, that we need to learn to trust each other. See, Ananias, though, he wasn't just simply a blind trust. You know, God said, go, okay, I'm going to go. But he was like, Lord, I don't want to do this. I've heard about this guy. And I think sometimes, you know, we, we sometimes think that trusting God is, is, is simply a blind trust, but that's not true. The fact is, you know, Ananias wasn't fully trusting. He was a little nervous. But in the end, what did he do? He obeyed God. And I think we need to do that in our relationships with each other. The relationships that we have as Christians, it has to be built on this word, trust. But trust is something that takes a long time to build. It requires a lot of time. It might be, you know, the Sunday coffee time. It might be meals together, fellowship time, parties. It might even be blenders of fear. But, you know, it's, it's getting together. It's spending time with one another. Because when you spend time, you get to know one another. You build those relationships. You learn to trust one another when you see the type of person they are. The one thing about relationships that's always very difficult is relationships are risky. The fact is we're all sinners. And the fact is that we're always going to fail each other. You might get hurt in building relationships. I worked with a pastor and I asked him, I said, do you have any friends in the church? He said, no. And I said, why not? He said, because I've been stabbed in the back. And I said, don't want to have friends in the church. And I was shocked. Because I think it's important to have relationships with one another. Because as we build, to, as we grow together, I think as a community we grow stronger. And that God then become, become more effective in reaching out. Relationships become risky, but we need to develop trust. And we, need from our, we see from our scriptures here that trust relationship happens often with Paul and Barnabas. And you read later on in the book of Acts, Paul and Mark. And you think about Jesus and his disciples. He entrusted them just like he entrusts us with the gospel, the good news. And do we fail Jesus? Uh, yeah, all the time. But the fact is, is God, that Jesus still trusts us. 
And we need to learn to trust each other in moving forward. Because I believe that relationships are the key to building strength within churches. I spent a lot of years working with youth, with teenagers, and one of the uh, youth uh, conferences I went to, the speaker said, he asked the whole group there, he says, how do youth define love? How do they define love? And so all of us had all these great answers, you know, hanging out together and all these different things. But with how youth, he said, define love, and I think it's true for all of us here to a certain degree. He says they define love T-I-M-E. That is time. That we spend time together. And it's, you know, it, it's because in spending time together we build those relationships. You look at even in our scripture reading, the Apostle Paul, you know, people spent time together. They spent time developing relationships, spent time together developing trust. And from that, God used them in a mighty way. So, first thing is, lesson we learned is we need to face up to our past. The second thing, we need to develop trust. But the third thing that I think is really important, and we see this from Paul's life throughout his life, is that we need to be willing to sacrifice and to serve. We need to be willing to sacrifice and serve. How many of you guys like being comfortable? Comfortable is good, right? How many like camping? Okay, I hate camping. Because I hate sleeping on the ground. Because to me, it's sleeping on the ground, it's not very fun. Um, our, our, my son went uh, camping this week and uh, he hates camping too. But they slept in a cabin, but one of the things he didn't like was they had to climb mountains, like hiking, like long hiking up mountains and stuff. Because it makes him uncomfortable, it gives him pain. And I think for all of us, you know, we, we like comfort. We don't like being in a place where we're uncomfortable. Uh, I've gone on, on various mission trips. I took a group of kids down to Mexico one year. And, you know, when you go on a mission trip, there's almost this romance where you think, oh, it's going to be so cool, you get to serve God and do all these great things. We were in a place where it was just raw sewage everywhere. Cockroaches on the walls. Um, we slept in a converted chicken barn. Like, they had the, these wooden bunk beds and this old chicken coop. Our showers were the old, the pig's feed troughs. The showers. And right next to us, because we were out sort of in this country, in the country in Mexico, right next to us, the farmer was fertilizing his fields while we were there. The showers were cold too, by the way, so if you don't like cold showers. It wasn't very comfortable. It wasn't very comfortable. But the cool thing was, we had an opportunity to serve God and be a blessing to a community that was in need. And if it meant stepping out of our comfort zone, and sacrificing both time, and some kids were getting sick because they're in Mexico, and you know, you're not supposed to drink the water, and of course they drank the water. And, you know, they were, they, it wasn't very, very comfortable, it wasn't very good. But because they were willing to step out and do that, I think it was a real blessing. And you look at the life of Paul, in verses not, uh, 15 to 17 in this passage, when, when God is speaking to Ananias, uh, God says uh, to him, he says, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Isn't that encouraging? That God wanted Paul to suffer. Now I'm being facetious here. Of course it's not encouraging. Nobody wants to suffer. But the reality is, is we, if we want to serve God, if we want to honor God, that there are going to be difficulties that are going to come into our life. You look at Paul's life. He was beaten many times. He suffered 39 lashes five times. He was beaten, whipped five times. He was shipwrecked three times. Stoned, and not in the way we talk about stone today. <laughs> but he was, you know, had rocks thrown at him. He was beaten with rods. You see, he was a man who was willing to give us all for Christ. He was a man who was willing to sacrifice his body for the sake of reaching out to the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He gave his all and ultimately gave his life for the kingdom. You see, sacrifice and service go hand in hand. We often think, well, I'll do my little bit. But the reality is, in doing our little bit, there's always a cost. 
And all we need to do is look back at what Jesus Christ did for us. That he endured it all for us. He was beaten, ridiculed, spit on, crucified. And I think as Christians, we kind of romanticize what Jesus Christ has done for us. Because we think, oh, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. I can go to heaven. That's great. But do we really understand what Jesus did and what he went through on our behalf? How many of you wear a cross? Anybody wear a cross around the neck? Do you ever wear crosses? You know, they're beautiful, right? Beautiful jewelry and stuff. It looks really cool. You see the cross up here. It's nice and nice and smooth. But the reality was the cross wasn't nice sanded wood that, you know, if you lied on it, it wouldn't be too bad. It was rough hewn. In other words, you touched it, you probably got some slippers. I used to help out at a Lutheran church in uh, Fort St. John, and they had this 30 foot high cedar cross, but it was rough hewn, it was rough. And what I like to do is I like to feel that, I like just to touch it, because it reminded me of the suffering of what Jesus did on our behalf. The Bible says that we're called to take on our cross and follow Jesus. So it doesn't mean we take on the smooth wood, but rather we take on this wood that's going to hurt, that's going to cause us discomfort. Following Jesus Christ costs. It costs us our time. It costs us our talents. It costs us our skills. It costs us money financially. The reality is to follow Jesus Christ means that we need to give up everything for him. Romans says, you know, to, that we offer up our lives as a living sacrifice to God. To sacrifice and to serve him requires us to give up all that we want, all we desire, in order to live our lives to honor him. And for some of us that might be a challenge because we like comfort. We like to have the toys in our lives. We like to live a certain kind of lifestyle. But the reality is that God is calling us to live lives that are holy, to live lives that are honoring to Him. Like, I'm not saying toys and things are bad, but I think what, it, what, what the Scriptures tell us and we see from the life of Paul is that if God is calling us to reach out, to step out of our comfort zone, it might mean that we need to make changes in how we live our lives. You know, when we were younger, we always had the desire to want to be, you know, you know, have money so I can live comfortably, go on my holidays, have the, you know, all the great things that the life, that life offers, all the comforts. But I mean, if that becomes our focus, then I think we've really lost touch with what God wants for us. Because ultimately, our ultimate prize has to be Jesus Christ. Paul writes, for where your treasure is, there also is your heart. And if our treasure is our focus is for our comfort, instead of honoring our lives, honoring God with our lives, then we put something in his place. Following Jesus means we need to be willing to sacrifice and to serve. And I think the Apostle Paul is a classic and powerful example of role model to all of us. Because too often we get molded by what the world says we should do. Too often we get molded by even what our culture says we should do. Instead of allowing God and his word to mold us into what we need to be doing. And the last principle I just want to share this morning is something I think is really important. Is that we need to stay focused on the goal. When you look at the Apostle Paul, when he became a Christian, when he became a follower of Jesus... His first thing was like just to go into the temple and just start arguing. He says, it's all about Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. And that was his goal. That was his focus all through life. The Apostle Paul also wrote so many letters and talked about running the race, keeping our eyes focused on the prize. Because he knew that it's easy for us to get distracted. It's like driving. You know, how many people text and drive? You're not supposed to do that yet. But the reality is we get distracted, right? You're driving along and, you know, for the guys, they might see some nice girl going inside the road. It's like, woo, you know, whatever. Or some, you know, you see a nice car or whatever. You know, you just, things distract us all the time. 
But as Christians, we need to keep our eyes focused on Christ and moving forward. And that's what the Apostle Paul, why he's a role model for us today, is that he kept his life focused. Jesus Christ kept his life focused. On those 33 or so years he spent on this earth, he knew what his purpose was. He knew what the goal was. He knew that his destiny was to die on the cross. And that's what his focus was. And as Christians, as a church, do we know what our focus is? Do you know what our focus is? I know many churches, you know, when people they focus on things like social justice, you know, working on human trafficking or the homeless. Some have to deal with other issues, maybe it's same-sex things or, or abortion. Like we have all these causes that sort of pull at us and tug at us. But look at what Jesus' purpose was for the Christians and for the church. Matthew 28, we know the Great Commission, right? To go into the world, make disciples, to teach, to baptize. And Matthew you know, 22 talks about you know, loving one another. That's what our focus should be. And I think it's easy for us as Christians to get, and as human beings, to get kind of distracted by tangible things all the time. It might be programs, it might be buildings. And we miss out on really what God has for us. We need to remain focused on the goal. The Apostle Paul remained focused on the goal. Jesus remained focused on the goal. I think all the apostles were pretty focused because in the end it all cost them their lives. But my question and my challenge is, are we willing to do that? William Blake said this. He said, he who desires but does not act breeds pestilence. You see, as Christians, I've seen, even in my own life, okay, this is a confession time too, where sometimes, you know, I think in my mind, oh yeah, I should live my life this way and do these different things, but I don't act on them. And I think sometimes as Christians, we, we have these grandiose ideas of what we want to do for God, but we don't act on them. And I think it's key for us as Christians is that we do act on them. Because we just can't be hearers of the word, as scripture says. But we need to be doers of the word as well. In Matthew chapter 6, 19, uh, 19 and 20, and I, I just shared this verse earlier. It says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there also your heart will be. You see, our goal should always be focused on God. And I think, you know, we desire to see the church grow. But without direction, without focus, without action, it won't happen. And I think part of that is, is when you enter into a new stage, we need to deal with the things in the past. And we need to build those relationships and redevelop the trust that needs to happen. And then we need to give of ourselves to sacrifice and to serve. And as we do so, I believe God will do the work. That he'll do the work in and through us that we might bring glory to his name. The Westminster Confession of Faith, if any of you have ever heard of it, is the uh, statement of faith for the uh, Presbyterian denomination. And in the first question, they do it in a question-answer format uh, when it comes to explaining doctrinal things. And the first question they ask is, what is the chief end of man? In other words, what's our purpose? And they answer it by saying, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So that's my hope for us as a church, as Christians, that our lives will be just dedicated and focused on glorifying God and enjoying Him. Because that's who we are in Christ. We are His children, loved, beloved, and that's what He wants for us. All of us are still growing and learning. I'm going to be 50 years old. No, I'm going to be almost 50. I'll be 50 years old next year. And, you know, for many of us, it, it feels kind of old in a way. But, you know, for, for me as a Christian, I still haven't gotten there yet. 
and I still have a long ways to go. But what I'm thankful for as a Christian, though, is that I can look at people like the Apostle Paul and say, you know, this is a man who is willing to give us all. I can look at Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This was a man, the Son of God, who was willing to give us all for me. And my hope and prayer is that we too can have that same attitude where we're willing to give our all for God. Because when we do that, I believe great things will happen.